Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well this morning. My name is Rosa Miller, and I'm bringing greetings from the Hinesville Seventh Adventist Church in Savannah, Georgia. So I'm happy to be here with you, and I hope that today will be a blessed service. Our call to worship will be taken from Psalms 21, verses 1 and 2. Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. We will now do our affirmation of faith. It's taken from Exodus 20, verse 8, and John 3, verse 16. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that it was in thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea and all in their midst, and, sorry brother, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let us pray. Kind and most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for a beautiful Sabbath day. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us the opportunity to come before you, even virtually, and to gather together. You say we're two and three is gathered. There you are in the midst of them. And so we invite your presence by the power of your Holy Spirit that you will aid and assist us and bless the technology. And may everything that we do and say may be a blessing to all who is in hearing of this, this presentation. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace and your mercy towards us all. Cleanse us from all sin and unrighteousness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
No, it's not. Because I serve a God that is able. You serve a God that is able? Yes. Able to do what? Able to protect us from the Syrian army. So I am going back to sleep. <laughs> open the eyes of this servant so that he can see that those who are with us are more than they that be against us. Thank you, Lord. That's it? Yes. They're gone? Go back outside and see. Oh, I'm scared. I'm scared. Go. so glad that you realize that the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that bear him. So we don't have to worry about the Syrian army. So I'm going back to sleep. <laughs>
The scripture reading for today will be taken from 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 11 through 16. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing, and he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel. Tell it the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots in a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Amen. Let the Lord have a blessing to the reading and the hearing of the Holy Word. Amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. The Word of God says, be strong in this might. And though the world is in a crisis, one thing that we can depend on, that he is faithful. Praise God. Thank you. 
Good morning. Greetings from the Fellowship Seventh-day Adventist Church in Tallahassee, Florida, and the Ephesus Seventh-day Adventist Church, Bainbridge, Georgia. We bring you virtual church on this beautiful Sabbath day. I want you to please pray in your heart. I feel so humble and so grateful that God has spared my life, that I'm here in the land of the living, just to say a few words for the Lord. Please pray in your hearts that Jesus and him only will be magnified today. The topic of this sermonette is spiritual blindness will lead to fear. Spiritual blindness will lead to fear. Let's pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. I would like to share with you this morning what God has highlighted for me for the past couple of weeks. I've been studying the book of Kings, 2 Kings to be more specific. And this morning, I'm going to bring to you from the sermon from 2 Kings chapter 6, 8 through 23. And it's the story of Elisha and the Syrian army. My sister Rosa, she gave you the scripture reading, so you have an idea of what we're talking about already. And this story, this story highlights individuals that have two types of blindness. One is physical blindness, and the other type of blindness is spiritual blindness. Now, which one do you think is worse? I know. You're saying, of course, it's spiritual blindness, and you're right. You see, physically, being physically blind, you've just lost your sense to see. But when you are spiritually blind, a person has actually lost their sense of sight and the vision that Christ had for his or her life. In other words, they have lost faith. And that, my friends, is not a good place to be. You know, there will be a lot of people who are physically blind here on earth that on this, upon the second coming of Christ, in the twinkling of an eye, when this mortal shall put on immortality, God will restore their sight better than 2020. So being blind here on earth is nothing because God can restore your physical sight. But when you are spiritually blind, that spiritually blind person has lost faith, has lost faith in God. And without faith, the Bible says, it's impossible to please God. So according to Hebrews, what is faith? What is faith? According to Hebrews, faith is the substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen. So when we have spiritual insight, when we're walking by faith, we don't depend on our eyes. When we're walking by faith, we don't depend on our eyes or what we see happening all around us. You know, we are not like the non-believers who get scared, who get perturbed, who get perplexed when they watch what's happening on Fox News and CNN and all the other news outlets because we get it. We know what's happening. We know what time it is. In fact, when we see all these news is coming out, when we see the headlines, it should get us excited because it only confirms that what we know, that Jesus is coming soon. So how do we know? How do we know that Jesus is coming soon? Because we have spiritual eyesight, faith in God. This means that we totally, totally place our confidence in God, who is the supreme being, supernatural being, who knows the beginning from the end. And so when we walk by faith and not by sight, 
we know that we are in God's hands. And having faith is a process. Walking in faith is a process. Every day, our faith should be growing more and more and more. God has given each one of us a measure of faith. But we have to exercise it, just like our muscles. Our muscles will not grow unless we exercise it. And if you don't use it, you will lose it, okay? So we must seek every opportunity to exercise our faith in God. So this morning, there's a question. What is the opposite of faith? What is the opposite of faith? I contend this morning that the opposite of faith is fair. Fair, looking back, I had some moments in my life, in my life personally, that caused my faith to grow. Uh, looking back, when I was around 22, 23, I'll give you a little instance, I <clears throat> was working. I was taking care of people in their homes. This was back in the 80s. I was making some good money. And I was making money and spending money. And I was just having a good time. I grew up in an Adventist home. My mother, my father, all Adventists, we grew up strong Adventists. But like many young people, when I left home, I backslid. I backslid. I occasionally went to parties. Back in the 80s, it was the disco. And I was going to church too. Party and church. Back and forth. And I was not satisfied with that life. I knew that the Lord didn't call me to do that. And I said, Lord, what will you have me to do? I need to surround myself with good Christian young people. So that I need support. And a bright idea came to my mind that there was a little college out there in Huntsville, Alabama that's called Oakwood College, now Oakwood University. And I got a bright idea. I should apply to their nursing school. So I said, Lord, if you let me get accepted, I know this application is late, it's June, I'm gonna send it in. If you let me get accepted, I know it's a sign from you that I should leave this place and go and better myself. Sent in the application, late June, one month later, I received an acceptance letter stating that you have been accepted into the School of Nursing. And they gave me a small little scholarship to boot. But it wasn't enough money. I said, Lord, I, I have this great job paying $60, $70 a, a day. And, 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 and I'm making good money. So I should leave this good paying job and go to a school that's out of state, find tuition, find living expenses, find food, Oh, I was fearful. I was uncertain what to do, what to do. Should I go? Should I stay? I told my mother. I said, Mom, what should I do? My mom was very supportive. She says, yes, yes, you need to go. You need to go. And when you go, take your younger brother and your younger sister. What? My younger brother and sister? I says, OK. I, I knew God could provide. I knew that God was faithful because he had gotten me out of some scrapes in the past, some troubles. And you don't need to know what trouble it was. Suffice to know that God had proven to me his faithfulness at that young age. So I said, okay, if you got me this job, I know that you will provide for me in Huntsville. In fact, one time, <clears throat> just to backtrack, the very job that I was on, I called the agency because I, I wanted to work in this particular area but I had not applied at this agency. So I called the agency and I was going to get an application and I said, hello, this is Daisy. And before, before I even told them my last name, they said, yes, Daisy, we have a job for you out of Miami Beach. Go down there. It'll pay you $60 a day, all living expenses paid for. What? You know that was only God. I hadn't even applied and they sent me on this job. I don't know if it was mistaken identity or what but God provided. So that showed me that those past experience proved to me that God was faithful. So with that, I says, okay, I'm going to Oakwood. So I packed my bag, packed my stuff, took my younger brother and sisters, 
because not only was my younger sister going, my other sister decided to come along. So now I had three dependents to find food, lodging, room and board, and monies for school. But God made a way. God made a way because Rosa, my youngest sister, she graduated from high school in Huntsville, Alabama at the age of 16. She went on to receive a bachelor's degree in biology from Oakwood University. My brother, he went on to receive his bachelor's of engineering, mechanical engineering from Oakwood University and Huntsville, Alabama University. And the Lord blessed me that I earned an RN BSN from Oakwood University, Huntsville University of Alabama. And I started my career in nursing. God is so good. God is so faithful. And throughout those entire four years, we never went hungry. We always had a place to live. God took care of myself, my brother, and sisters for four years. Isn't God good? Can I get a witness? I can't hear you. <laughs> so what a God who cares. That tells me God cares about our problems. He's concerned about our fears, no matter how small, how insignificant you may think. God cares, and he is faithful. So... I'm still a work in progress. God is still working on me. So thanks be to God for his mercies. I want you to pray that I remain faithful and that you remain faithful also. So back to the story, talking about blindness, blindness. So for me, blindness is very bad. It's worse than being deaf or dumb. The ability to see connects you to the world in real time. But as bad as being physically blind is, being spiritually blind is far worse. Why? Because when a person suffers from spiritual blindness, a person, uh, <clears throat> a person loses their connection with God. Their, 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 their blindness causes a defect, a character defect called fear. A character defect called fear. Well, have you ever met someone who's always fearful? They're fearful about this. They're fearful about that. God has not given us a spirit of fear. God has given us a spirit of love and being sound mind. Just like when the disciples were on the boat in that stormy sea and they feared for their life and they cried out, Jesus' first response was, O oh, ye of little faith. Oh, ye of little faith, because fear is the opposite of faith. God knew, God knew that we would struggle with this. God knew that we would struggle with this, fear. Why? Because that is the human condition after sin, for us to be fearful. That's what Adam and Eve did when they discovered that they had sinned. They were fearful. So God has given us over 100 times in his word, fear not, fear not, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. So when we operate from a place of fear instead of faith, we end up making poor decisions, poor decisions. You may say, oh, I'm so fearful of being alone. I'm so fearful of staying by myself. When will I ever find someone to marry? If you operate from that place of fear, you may end up making a big mistake. God may see that the only way that he can save you is to keep you single. Or you have to have faith and wait until God provides you the proper mate. So you may also have a fear on the job, fear of not being promoted. Fear of losing out on the, your big job, so you're going to quit this and going to go to another one. God may have you in that job, keeping you humble, because you may suffer from pride. So you must have faith, knowing whatever happens, God is working it out for you. Um, you may have a problem with sickness, some disease that you've been struggling with. Something that you are, you've been praying that God would heal you 
for months, for years, and it's still happening, it's still going on, and you're still praying, and you're still having faith, and you're having people intercede on your behalf. But God may, in his wisdom, keep that thorn in your side in order to save you, my friend. Have faith, have faith in God. So now let's compare faith versus fear. Fear leads to mental stagnation. Faith leads to growth. Fear leads to depression. Faith leads to joy. Fear leads to poor life choices and the inability to see God's great plan for your life. But the word of God states, as I stated before, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a strong mind. 2 Timothy 1, verses 7. So don't let spiritual blindness, which is lack of faith, mess with your mind. And that brings us now to today's story. What was going on with the king of Syria in response to Elisha? The scripture reading, 2 Kings chapter 6, 8 through 14. Let me recap. Syria was at war with Israel. They became a thorn in Israel's side. And so the king of Syria set up camp in order to capture the king of Israel. And each time he set up a roadblock, each time he set up an encampment, and he had good from good sources that the king of Israel were in such and such a place, the king of Israel at the last minute would move. And this happened twice. So the king of Syria was very angry. And he called all his men and he said, which one of you men are traitors? Which one of you are telling the king of Israel when I'm going to capture him the time and the place and he escapes at the last minute? Well, the servant said, oh, king, live forever. None of us are traitors, but there is a man. There is a man of God called Elisha. And no matter what you say, whether it's in the war room or whether it's in the bedroom, whatever you say, God reveals it to this man, Elisha, and he tells the king of Israel at the last minute what our plans are. And that's how the king of Israel escapes. Well, the king of Syria was livid. He says, you know what? You know what? I want you to go spy. Find out where this Elisha man is. And when you find out where he, this Elisha is, you come back and you give me word. You give me word. So that brings us to 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 16, verses 15 and 16. So the situation unfolds that now Elisha and his servant is sleeping. And then Elisha's servant wakes up in the morning and he goes outside probably to go and get breakfast ready, to get some tea, and lo and behold, what did Elisha's servant see? 2 Kings 6, turn with me, 2 Kings 6 verses 15 and 16. And when the servant of the man of God had risen early and gone forth, behold, a host come past the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, verses 16, Fear not, for they that be with us are more that be with them. Whoa! You can't imagine waking up in the morning, looking outside, and up on the hills and all around, your enemies have surrounded you. They're on, chari they're on chariots, they're on horses, they have their sword drawn, they're ready to do battle. And all that army is focused on capturing and killing you. Oh, you can't imagine how fearful that would have been for Elisha's servant. By all human standard, he had a right to be fearful. But that very moment of fear, in that very moment of fear, Elisha's servant should have claimed 
the promise of God. He should have claimed like Psalms 91. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that fly by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasted at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Hallelujah! I'm having church up here today. God said that he will be our protection. When God said it, you can go to the bank and you can claim it. Elijah's servant should have claimed the promise of God when he saw that army. But his fate wavered. He got scared, just like us. He forgot. He forgot the times that God had performed miracles on behalf of Elisha and Israel. He forgot the past as he faced the future. You know, there are words of encouragement from our prophetess, our last day prophet, spirit of prophecy. She says these potent words, which you hear all the time, but in these days, we need to claim these words. It says, in reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say, praise God, as I see what the Lord has wrought. I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Beautiful. We have nothing to fear unless we forget the way the Lord has led us. So friends, another question. Are you fearful today? Are you fearful today? Let's be honest, we are. We are surrounded by bad news. COVID pandemic, over 200,000 people has died in the USA alone and the numbers keep rising. There are fires in California, out of control, apocalyptic type of fires that cannot be quenched and they are still fighting those fires. Lives are being lost. There were five tropical depressions in the Gulf last week. One came on board. Life and property was lost. Huh? Political strife, both here and abroad. Financial instability. People have lost their jobs. People have to look for income other places. People who have never claimed unemployment, they're in line. There are mom and pop jobs lost. Social unrest is everywhere. Social injustice in, on full display, highlighted by the social media that can tape it in real time. So, are you fearful about the future? Are you fearful of what's happening around you? Well, it's time that we start trusting in God and it's time that we start claiming God's divine promises because he and only he has our future in his hands. So do you remember in your past when God had brought it home for you? Do you remember in your past when you were sick on your sick bed and God raised you up, well, he will do it again. He will do it again. You just have to have faith. Have faith, my friend, in God. So I present to you now Elisha's servant, who is exhibit number one for spiritual blindness. Remember, our topic is spiritual blindness will lead to fear. So Elijah's servant is exhibit number one for spiritual blindness. 
So Elijah's servant was paralyzed with fear as he stared at the Syrian army. Huh? He was reviewing all possible scenarios of what could go down. And none of those scenarios turned out good in his mind. Oh, he was shaking in his boots. Then comes Elisha, man of faith. 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 17. And it states, And Elisha prayed. And Elisha prayed. When we're faced with fear, we are to pray. We ought to pray. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountains was full of horses and chariots and fire all about Elisha. Wow, what a sight. What a sight to behold. A mountain full of not just plain men on horses and chariots. These were the angelic hosts on horses and their chariots were blazing with fire. Why was, why was Elisha's servant exhibit one for spiritual blindness? Why was he my exhibit one? If Elijah's servant had spiritual vision, if his spiritual vision was 2020, when he looked at the band of enemies, the Syrian army around the city, he would not have succumbed to fear. By faith, he would have known that God's protection was there. But like many of us, his faith wavered. And even though he was witness to the miracles that God performed, through Elisha in the past, he freaked out, he panicked. Why? Because he did not have that first-hand experience with God. He did not have that one-on-one -on -one with God. He was virtually living his spiritual life through the man of Elisha. He needed a personal encounter with God. And God, in his goodness and mercy, provided that personal encounter for Elisha's servant. You see, every one of us, every one of us must know God for himself. We cannot rely on our pastor's experience. We can't rely on Pastor Carr's spiritual experience for us to have faith in God, especially in times like these. We can't rely on our parents' experience to have faith in God. We cannot rely on our spouse's experience. You see, it's not transferable. So, in God's goodness, he honored Elisha's request. Open the eyes of this young man. Let him see that those who are with us are more than those who are against us. Let us see that one plus God is the majority. Let him know that when the angels were kicked out of heaven, only one third went with the devil, but two thirds remained faithful to God. And these ministering angels are God's angels that are still ministering to us today. God is such a good God. So did you know, did you know that Elisha's servant was the only one that saw this, these host of angels on the chariots of fire. The only one. The Syrian army didn't see the host of the Lord or else they would have fled. Elisha didn't see, he was still in bed. And he already knew that God has a, was said protection. That's why he prayed, open the eyes of this young man. So all that display all those angels, all those chariots of fire was for the benefit of one servant so that his faith in God would grow. Isn't that wonderful? God is so good. You can tell me, you cannot tell me that my God is not a personal God. 
He will spare nothing, nothing in order to save us. He moved heaven and earth when he sent his only begotten son to this world. He wants to have a relationship with us and he wants our faith in him to grow. Yes, he wants us to have that relationship with him. So, if you notice, Elijah prayed in the prayer, Lord, open the eyes of this servant. He didn't pray to open his eyes. Like I said, Elijah's spiritual eye was already open. Elijah was a prophet. He was a faithful prophet. He was a prophet that had an anointing, a double portion of God's Holy Spirit. So by faith, he already knew that the army of the Lord was around him. He had what you call spiritual discernment. Spiritual discernment. So I'm not talking about um, having sixth sense. I'm not talking about being telepathic. I'm not talking about some voodoo, clairvoyant, horoscope, palm reading, Ouija board, demonic medium, seance communication with the devil. Call me Miss Cleo. Oh no, I'm talking about the real prophet of God having spiritual discernment. I'm talking about faith in God, the creator of the universe. Faith in his word, faith in God's promises, and with the faith and promises that God has given us, we need to trust God. So this is the type of faith that Elijah had. Psalms 34, verse 7. Psalms 34, verse 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Can I get a witness? You see, when God shows up, you will know that he is there. His presence will be known. You see, God, God is an eternal fire. So the hosts or the chariots were on fire. Fire, good fire, true fire, not counterfeit fire. Fire in the Bible depicts the presence of God. Remember Moses seeing the burning bush. That was the presence of God. The pillar of fire in the wilderness that overshadowed the Israelites as they passed through the wilderness, that was the presence of God. The fire that came down on Mount Carmel when Elijah was there, that was the presence of God. But this morning, friends, I want to contend to you that the most important fire that we should be concerned about is the fire of baptism. To be filled with the Holy Ghost so that our faith in God can grow. That's the type of fire that we need today so that we can testify of the goodness of God. So we will not be ashamed of the gospel of God. We will have no fear and we will boldly say, anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below. Anywhere without him, dearest joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus, I am not afraid. So going back to the story, 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 18. We read, we read. And when they came down to him, Elijah prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Here we have exhibit number two, spiritual blindness and physical blindness. And exhibit number two is the Syrian army. The Syrian army, they needed to learn a lesson because they kept on failing the tests. They kept on pursuing after the people of God. So they needed to learn a lesson. You know, sometimes God has to blind us in order to get our attention. Sometimes God has to blind us 
in order for us to see. We may be so bent, so bent on doing our own thing, in spite of the consequences, regardless of we knowing that this is wrong. Sometimes God has to stop us in our tracks before we get the message. And God will do it in order to save us. God chastises those whom he loves. God will name us in order to save us. Three times this army set up to capture the, uh, the, um, the, the king of Israel. Three times their plans were foiled. God was trying to get their attention. God's army could have wiped out the Syrian army. One angel could have wiped them out. In fact, it was in God's mercy that God blinded them in order for them to see the goodness of the Lord and repent. Oh yes, God wanted the Syrian army to repent. Yeah, God is not just interested in seven-day Adventists being saved. God has his people in the Baptist church. God has his people in the Presbyterian, in the Anglican, in the Catholic church. God has his people in all churches, and when that time comes, God is going to call them out, and he's going to have one flock, one fold. So God wanted to save the Syrian army, because God's word said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. So salvation is open for everyone. So the Lord did it for someone else in the Bible. God had to blind some other folks in the Bible. Uh, the Lord wanted to save Pharaoh. Pharaoh, yes, Pharaoh in Egypt, at the Red Sea, at the Red Sea. God had given them 10 chances, 10 plagues, in order for them to recognize who God was. And they still pursued, they still pursued God's people. So at the Red Sea, God set up a pillar of fire, blinding them so that they, they could not move forward. But they were still bent on doing evil. So they missed out a chance. Another story of God blinding someone was Saul. He got converted and became Paul, the great apostle. God had to blind him in order for him to see. So now, so now the Syrian army blind, physically, because they were spiritually blind. What a sight, what a sight. That huge army couldn't see. So in order for them to move, they had to probably hold on each other's shoulders and move like this along. So Elijah said, oh yeah, follow me. I'll show you where to go. <laughs> Second Kings 6, 19 and 20. And Elijah said to them, this is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom ye seek. But he led them to Samaria. And it came to pass, when they had come to Samaria, that Elijah said, Lord, open the eyes of these men, that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw. And behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. Ha! What a shock! What a shock to these blind Syrians when their eyesight was restored. <laughs> they discovered that they were smack right in the midst of the enemy camp, Samaria. <laughs> Trapped, outwitted, outwitted by the man of God. They were like sitting ducks, waiting to be slaughtered. But to, their, but to their surprise, they were spared. They weren't killed. Check this out. The word Shamron in Hebrew translation is the translation of Samaria. And Samaria literally means watch mountain, watchtower. So, so the Lord opened the eyes of the Syrian army, the enemy, in the city of Samaria. Watchtower. Isn't that wonderful? 
Do you get it? Brought them to the watchtower. What were they to watch when their eyes were open? They were to watch the goodness of the Lord. They were to watch his mercy and his grace. They were to watch his loving kindness in sparing their lives. Oh, God is so good. They, they, they could have repented. They were to turn around and walk in newness of life. So the question, another one. So when God heals you, when God rescues you, when miracles are performed on your behalf, when the prayers of the saints who are interceding on your behalf are answered, when what was meant for evil in your life turned out to be good, what is your response? Do you pick up right where you left off? Do you, or do you turn around and repent and walk by faith in newness of life? Do you say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Just like the Syrian army, we've all been there. Faithless, faithless, blind by unbelief. But God said, and God is saying this morning, wake up, wake up. Open your eyes. I want to save you. I want to save you. Because God says in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, say the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you an expected end. How beautiful that is. We are living in the last hours preparation here on earth before Christ makes his appearing before the coming of the Lord. And the question is, are we spiritually discerning the time or are we blind? Because being blind will only bring fear. Being blind in this time will only conjure fear. Versus seeing with your spiritual eyes Faith, redeeming the times as the coming of the Lord draw it near, should bring us joy, peace, great expectancy. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Is that the song that we sing? Oh, yes. Now we're down to exhibit number three, spiritual blind character in this story. We're going to meet another spiritually blind character in this story. Exhibit number three. 2 Kings 6, 21 to 22. And the king of Israel, he's the one that's spiritually blind, said unto Elisha, when he saw them, when he saw the Syrian army, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? Shall I kill him? Huh? Verse 22. And he answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Huh? That's what a man of God did. Mercy. And grace. You know, we human beings can be so revengeful. When someone has done us wrong and we get an opportunity to settle the score, oh yeah, we're going to take advantage. But God said, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He is the only righteous judge. So the advice that Elijah gave to the king. Don't kill him. These are prisoners of war. Would you kill the prisoner of war? No, 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 no. That's not what we're going to do. We're God's people. We're going to feed them. We're going to treat them well. And then we're going to send them back home. Yes! 
What Elijah did illustrate mercy, grace, and forgiveness. These are the very things that Christ has given to us. And what God said, if he's done it for us, we should do it for one another. You know the story in Rwanda, the Rwanda genocide? Well, there was a woman who witnessed the brutal murder of her son and husband during that terrible time of the genocide in Rwanda. At the end of the war, the criminals were gathered and they were placed in prison. So this woman, instead of wallowing in self-pity, instead of being eaten up by hate, this woman decided to start a ministry to visit these criminals in jail and to pray with them and to offer them toiletries and whatever th other things she could provide for them. One day, she came face to face with the murderer of her husband and son. And he confessed and he begged her for forgiveness. And she forgave him. Not only that, when this man was released from prison after he served his sentence, this same woman took this man in her home, adopted him as her son, and she said, now you're going to replace the son that you took from me. And she treated him like her son, and they lived together. They were inseparable. Forgiveness. That's what I call godly. So back to the story. The king of Israel wanted to take revenge out on the Syrian army. He wanted to kill them. But Elijah said, stop. Let's show them some grace. Let's show them some mercy. Let's show them what God would do. Let's heap coals of fire on their head. Let's kill them with kindness, huh? Let's love our enemies as ourselves. Let's do good to them that hate us. That's a novelty. And so we come to our last exhibit, Elisha. Elisha, a man with spiritual discernment, a man with 2020 spiritual vision. What a man of God. 2 Kings 6, verse 23. And he prepared a great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master. So the band of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. As you continue to read this story, and there are other stories in the book of Kings, you will see that the Syrians no longer threatened Elisha. No longer did they have a, 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 a warrant out for the arrest and capture of Elisha. In fact, his enemies became his friend. They took him in as an advisor, as a confidant. Yes. So in closing, God has blessed our church with eyesight. Yes. With the gift of prophecy. We can understand all mysteries all the prophetic books of Daniel and Revelation. We can discern the times that we are living in right now more than any other people on the face of the earth. We know what time it is. We have a clear picture of what Christ is doing right now in the heavenly sanctuary, blotting out our sins. We know that the hour of his judgment has come since 1844. We know that we are living in the end times and that right now we're living between the sixth and seventh seal described in Revelation. And we as a people, we know that we have been called by God according to Revelation 11, when God ordained that we should rise up and prophesy again after that great disappointment. So what a gift God has given us, his people, the gift of prophecy. So we, as a people of prophecy, should be the last people on earth to be fearful. 
We should have no fear because we know the end of the story. God has revealed to us his plans. Oh, friends, what faith we should have in a God like that. Along with the gift of prophecy that we share, we should be, or we are, pardon. We are the most loving, most hospitable people on the face of the earth. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. And that's what Jesus would do. We are to reflect the very image of God. So, personal question this morning. Personal question. Do I reflect the image of God to my family? Do I love my family? Do I reflect the image of God to my friends? Do I reflect the image of God to my church brethren? Do I reflect the image of God to my neighbor, my co-workers? And last of all, do I reflect the image of God to my enemies? God said, though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I give my body to be burned, if I do not have love, it profiteth me nothing. So yes, we are the Laodicean church. We are the church that is lukewarm, lukewarm. But God has given us a remedy, and that remedy to correct our spiritual blindness is the eye salve. The eye salve of revelation applied to our spiritual eyes so that we can see. So in closing, I invite all present out there in virtual land, I invite you to take a stand with me and ask Christ to apply his eye salve to our eyes. Christ's eye salve is the only remedy for spiritual blindness. And guess what, friends? It's guaranteed to make us see. It's guaranteed to make us see. So let's pray as the music softly play. Let's bow our heads. Lord, open my eyes as you open the eyes of this young man. Open the eyes of every woman, every boy, every girl in the hearing of my voice. Open the eyes of your people that we may see your love and your mercy and your grace. From the very beginning, it was all about your love for us. The human race, you love us with an arm, dying never-ending love. You've given us faith, hope, and love. Let us keep our eyes on you, dear Lord. You are our only hope. Thank you, Lord, for loving us in spite of our failings, in spite of our shortcomings, in spite of our faithlessness. We claim the promise, dear Lord, that you gave us in Romans 8, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or pearl or sword? And the answer is, nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ that is in Christ Jesus. Amen and amen and amen. We will now have our closing hymn sung by Rosa. Open my eyes, Lord, open my eye, Lord, that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Open my eyes that I may see of truth 
thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclass and set us free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God, thy will to see. Open mine eyes, illumine me, spirit, spirit divine. so that we can see you and be like you. Bless those who have made a commitment today to follow you all the way. Heaven has taken note, and we just want to praise you today and forever, looking forward for your coming. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 